Hey, it's Cognosis, and I'm excited to be talking to Dr. Kyle Smith about his book, Call to the Dead. Hi, Dr. Smith. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, John. How are you? Good, good, good. So what inspired you to write Call to the Dead? And I, I guess this is a multi-part question, so there's part A. But I was wondering if yeah. you can explain the title, because uh, many non-scholars may see that and think, you know, oh, okay, like, is he saying Christianity is a death cult, like Heaven's mm-hmm. Gate or something? Is this, is this one of those new atheist books? What's, what's up with this? So can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so let me give some uh, some background, and then I'll explain the, the, the title a bit, right? Um, I mean, I've been studying texts about early Christian martyrs for years. I mean, mainly the long sort of narrative stories that are told about them, uh, but also the, the encomia, or, or the speeches of praise that are written about the martyrs, about the homilies that are preached in their honor um, on their feast days, which is to say, you know, the date on the calendar when uh, uh, they were believed to have died. Um, and I've written a number of, of books, including uh, translations of some of these texts, uh, specifically in Syriac, which is a, a dialect of, of Aramaic uh, that became the preeminent Christian literary language throughout large parts of the Eastern Mediterranean and Northern Mesopotamia. Um, but what I wanted to do with this book um, was, first of all, go beyond just the literary stories about the early Christian saints to include all of the ritual and cultural practices um, by which the martyrs were remembered for centuries, many centuries. Um, So in other words, to put the martyrs at the center of the story of Christianity, to tell uh, a a brief history as the subtitle is, uh, says, uh, you know, which is a bit of a bait and switch because we don't really quite get up to the 21st century, but at least beyond the Protestant Reformation. to tell that story uh, over the centuries with the martyr, uh, martyrs at the center. And secondly, to do so in a way that I hope is entertaining for a non-specialist audience, right? And this is the first sort of non-academic uh, book that I've written or specifically scholarly book. Um, and so about the title though, what does that mean, Cult of the Dead? Um, I'm not being dismissive here of Christianity or, or suggesting that it's like Heaven's Gate, as you, as you said, or you know, some other sort of, uh, of cult. And I understand that when we hear that word cult, or you say, you know, oh, his sister ran off and joined a cult, this is not a good thing, right? You think of you know, dark back alleys and candlelit stuff and who knows whatever else. Um, but that is not the way in which uh, scholars of early Christianity use the term. Uh, to refer to the cult of the saints is a very common phrase by way of referring to the ways in which Christians have cared for their saints. I mean, that really is what the word means. Like think of the word agriculture. It literally means to care for the fields, right? Or to cultivate a plant or a a child's love of music is to nurture it, right? To care for it. Um, So when you're talking about the cult of the dead or the cult of the saints in Christianity, um, it's it's all of these practices that go well beyond just the stories about the martyrs um, to talk about how they, the martyrs, how they, the martyrs, remained very much alive uh, through their continued presence in the ritual life of of the church via the days that they're remembered on the calendar, these homilies that I mentioned that are being preached in their honor, the shrines, the churches that are dedicated to them, even the veneration of their physical remains, uh, their their relics, um, and the many miracles that were attributed to the intercession of the relics or in the intercession of the saints. So that's the book, right? To explain, again, in what I hope is an entertaining way that traverses a lot of geography, a lot of chronology, um, how the culture of Christianity for most of its history is really best understood as a cult of the saints. Yeah. Yeah. And and could you, uh, for those unfamiliar, can you explain what a cultural history is? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I mean, uh, this is a, a complicated sort of uh, uh, subgenre of history writing, but in just to distill it to one quick sentence, it's a means of writing history that focuses specifically on the arts and the culture of a particular people in a particular place. Um, so again, all of these rituals uh, by which uh, uh, Christians have remembered their dead. So that's the that's the historical focus.
Yeah. And uh, so recent scholarship, it, it's tended to downplay the amount of early Christian martyrs as opposed to what we mm. find in re religious histories, or I'd even say the public imagination, right? If you're talking to somebody off That's the right. street, I don't know why you'd be talking to somebody off the street about this, but, you know, there's a, uh, a, a common conception that uh, uh, Christians were, were thrown to the lions by the hundreds, right? That there was mass slaughter of the Christians. Um, but uh, the recent scholarship uh, has has really interrogated this, found out that, that, that a lot of this was, was legendary. Um, but mm -hmm. were there early martyrs then, and, and why were they martyred? Yeah, um, I mean, so se several questions there, right? Um, you know, I might, I, and I might rephrase it just a bit. Um, were there Christians who, for whatever reason, were killed by the authorities in late antiquity? Yes, undoubtedly. Were some of them remembered as martyrs, as witnesses to the faith for having given their lives rather than deny Christ? Yeah, also, yes, that, that I think is un, uh, undoubtedly the case. Um, but were, to, your, to your, the first part of your point, were thousands of Christians being killed for their faith in antiquity? Um, there's just not the evidence to bear this out. And I think that, I'm, I mean, I'm certainly not the, the first to say that. As you say, it's uh, become uh, quite a point of scholarly investigation over the past however many decades. Um, but I, I'm very fond of, of pithy quotations that, you know, distill things down to their essence, um, to their most sort of intelligible essence. And I think Paula Fredrickson put it best when she said, look, there weren't thousands of Christians being killed in antiquity, but there were thousands of people who were enamored by reading, reciting, uh, repeating, remembering the stories of those few who were, right? So just as you said, right, you you have this sort of popular ima imagination that's completely understandable, right? You, you, even to the person on the street that you mentioned, um, that uh, well, though there must have been thousands of Christians being killed because we hear so much about the martyrs, right? Um, if you talk about walking down walking down the street, we'll walk around on any city in, in whether in Europe or North America, South America, other places, and you're constantly running into St. George Street, St. Andrew Subway Stop, uh, you know, St. Sebastian School, and so on. We're constantly surrounded by the martyrs, even if we don't have any idea who George or Andrew or Sebastian was, we see these saints' names all over the place, okay? Um, so I think that when the story gets told again and again and again, it's it sticks, and it assumes uh, an important that is uh, that, that is perhaps perhaps goes beyond uh, its impact in the particular period or the uh, or the event of a particular period that it is describing. Okay, um, so I, I, you know I, I think that that's I think what's important to understand is that um, especially when the stories are being told annually when there are churches that are dedicated to all of these martyrs, when there are pilgrimages that are specifically devoted uh, you know, to going to a shrine of this or that martyr. Um, when, uh, just as I said, you know, even today, uh, we've got all these streets and schools and subway stops that are still named for the saints. They assume an importance that looms very, very large. Um, but I, I want to go back to one of your one of the other questions that you said in terms of you know why were the early Christians killed? Um, why were some killed? Um, I, I think that's an important question to answer, and it's not an easy question to answer because you have to be you have to focus on uh, particular time periods in particular places. So it wasn't always just a one size fits all answer. So for example, a lot of those martyrs uh, uh, whose stories are told in Syriac that I mentioned that that I have worked on uh, quite a lot who were being killed according to these stories in the Persian empire outside of the Roman empire. So in uh, what's, what's nowadays, uh, what's nowadays Iraq, basically. So Northern Mesopotamia, Northern and Central Mesopotamia. Um, according to some of those stories, uh, the Christians were killed because the patriarch of the Christians, this guy by the name of Simeon Barsabae, Simeon, the son of cloth dyers, uh, refused to co collect extra taxes that the king of Persia supposedly imposed upon all the Christians of his realm. Do we have any evidence for this? No. What, why is this story being told? It's complicated, but you know, that text and then the, those who receive that text in the Roman Empire talk about the Persians killing tens upon tens of thousands of Christians. Again, the evidence just doesn't bear that out. Um, but, you know, that 
So maybe taxes has one reason to do with it. That's in Persia. I think in the Roman Empire, um, one of the most intriguing episodes of, uh, of Christian persecution didn't start out that way uh, as, mm-hmm. an, as intentionally uh, being focused on Christians. And the, the, the episode that I'm referring to is a decree that was issued by the Roman Emperor Decius uh, in the middle of the third century. So Decius had a very short reign. Um, he, after defeating the reigning emperor Philip, uh, in, and by the summer of 249, um, he becomes emperor. By the summer of 251, he's dead. Very short reign, right? Um, but he came to power during a tumultuous time. It was a bad situation. You've got Germanic tribes invading. You've got the Persians press, pressing in from the east. You've got a constant assassination of one emperor after the next. You've got rebellions. You've got a devaluation of the coinage. You've got other economic problems that are going on in the middle of the third century in the Roman Empire. So how do you turn this around? Well, it seems that Decius had this idea that uh, that everyone in the empire wasn't doing what they were, what they should have been doing to honor the gods. How does the empire survive? How does the empire flourish again? Well, through the favor of the gods. So what does he say? Uh, he issues this decree saying that you have to uh, have an official receipt for having made sacrifice. Often this was an animal sacrifice of some sort, though it could have been another sort of sacrifice, pouring out of wine or uh, an offering of incense or something like that. And this, uh, it, it, it barely caused a blip in, in terms of the Roman history of the period. It's unremembered, but it caused quite a stir among Christians, right, who took it as a specifically uh, an affront against them because it was known by this time that Christians weren't going to be offering bits of incense to the Roman emperor as a god or to the other sorts of gods. You know, so Christians get maligned as being atheists, which, you know, sounds very perplexing to us to say, how, well, how would Christians be atheists? Well, if they're not honoring the gods of Rome, and they're not doing their duty to help support the Roman state such that those same gods will help Rome, then they're atheists. They're, and they're also bad citizens, right? Um, so you know, now this kind of becomes this civic obligation. It was uh, 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 not only that, but it was a marker of your self-identification with the Roman Empire if you went along with uh, this requirement to sacrifice. But I think the important point here, um, just to come back to this why question, is that um, is that it wasn't directed at Christians. That decree was direct, was empire wide, and we have receipts that were found in the Egyptian desert, you know, that say something to the effect of "I, the a priestess of the goddess Sukos or such and such, have duly sacrificed." Right? This is not a Christian, so right? so yes. this is this is this is being directed elsewhere, but Christians took it and understood it uh, as an attack on them. And some of those who refused to sacrifice and very pu- publicly uh, refused to do so and may have ended up in bad, a bad situation as a result, um, you know, the stories that are told about them are the ones that get remembered for this episode. Right. And yeah. um, maybe an obvious question, maybe not, um, but why yeah. did early Christians revere martyrs? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you can answer that question by looking uh, at Jesus, right? Yes, unlike the martyrs, he's understood as the Messiah, as the divine son of God, you know, sent to wash away the sins of the world, redeem humanity through his sacrificial death, however you want to phrase it. Um, But a testimony to the truth of his message is that this willing acceptance of death, at least as it's narrated uh, in in Luke's gospel about Jesus, right? So you've got the cross. You've got the means by which Jesus was killed. It's an instantly recognizable symbol of Christianity and has been so for many, many centuries. But part of what I want to do with this book and what I wanted to show to uh, to general readers is that what's often forgotten about the cross is how early Christians held it up as a model for imitation again and again and again. It wasn't just like living like Jesus lived is the model to follow here, but being willing to die for him if, uh, or at least die rather than renounce 
his name or renounce their faith if it happened to come to that. And the roots of that are right in the New Testament itself, right? I mean, think about how the Gospels quote Jesus as warning his disciples that they're going to be, you know, flogged and dragged before kings and governors all for the sake of his name. Or think about how the Acts of the Apostles uh, narrates the death of Stephen, uh, the deacon Stephen, uh, who's traditionally celebrated as the first Christian martyr. Right? He gets interrogated by the high priest in Jerusalem. He gives this long speech uh, invoking the patriarchs of the Hebrew Bible, all by way of saying, prophets are always persecuted. Now you've just betrayed and murdered Jesus, the righteous one, as, as Stephen calls him. Right? And then as he's being stoned to death, uh, we get this absolutely fascinating parallel in, uh, in the book of Acts between Jesus' Jesus's death, as it's narrated in Luke, and that of Stephen, as it's narrated in Acts. So, Jesus, so Stephen repeats Jesus' final words uh, from the cross. But instead of saying, as Jesus does, Father, receive my spirit, Stephen says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, right? This is why he's called the first Christian martyr, because in more or less his, his own words, he says, he, here he is, he's dying for Christ. And I mean, and to give it one more example from the many hundreds that I could choose from outside of the Bible, we hear from Ignatius, uh, who's the Bishop of Antioch in the early second century. He writes uh, uh, a letter to those who might, enter, he's being uh, he writes a series of letters as he's being dragged from Antioch to Rome to be thrown to the lions, as you mentioned before. And he writes uh, uh, a number of letters, um, one of which uh, specifically says to the people who might intervene on his behalf and save him from being killed. He says, no, 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 you're not doing me any favors by, by, by saving me and not letting me be killed. He says, I want to be ground up in, a, in the lion's jaws. He, he says, this is just what it means to be a disciple of Christ, okay? So, I mean, once you start going down this path and you're reading not just about the apostles, uh, you know, for whom there, um, almost all of them, there is some tradition or another, in many cases, multiple traditions about how they met some sort of grisly end, all of Jesus's closest followers, uh, but also Stephen, Ignatius, and just scores of others. It becomes a little unsettling, right? I mean, this is not, you know, some sort of um, prosperity gospel or some sort of, you know, Jesus wants to make you healthy and wealthy and wise, right? Um, I mean, the thread of much of this literature from the early church is just what Ignatius says, that being willing to die for Christ isn't some sort of lofty ideal, but just what it means to be a, a true disciple. Yeah. 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 Um, What's special about the relationship between Christians and the dead that, you know, wasn't found in, in other religions or in contemporary movements at the time? And, of course, again, you know, I say contemporary movements. We're talking about, uh, you know, the late antique period. We're talking about some different cultures and different times, but generally, generally. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean... I, I would say that uh, that many cultures and religions, I mean, al actually almost all, I would gather, uh, have a great amount of respect for the dead. Um, you know, many religious practices might change, uh, but the ones that tend to be most resistant to change are funeral and burial practices. Those are the ones that take a long time to make any sort of change, because that's not what you want to touch, right? You want to bury your dead in the same way that, you know, you, uh, you know, bury your parents in the same way that your parents buried their parents and their parents buried their parents, right? And you, you maintain a unity there. Um, so, you know, that's, that's on, on the one hand. But um, I would say that, that Christian notions of, so I, I would say that Christians don't necessarily respect their dead any more than other cultures or other religions or that there's necessarily a special relationship. However, um, the, the special relationship might come from the fact that the, the preeminent figure of Christianity, Jesus, obviously, um, died very violently. Uh, and was then bodily assumed into heaven. So you have a, a new understanding uh, of the body, of death and rebirth and resurrection that, that, that doesn't play out in the same way in other religions, right? This is a novel contribution here. Um, but Christian notions of martyrdom they didn't just emerge from the ether, right? Um, like most things, they were a product of their, their cultural context. Um, so I think while it might be difficult to argue that martyrdom, as we understand it now retrospectively in the Christian sense, um, while it might be difficult to argue that that was, um, was also idealized in other cultures, and I'm not quite sure that it was, um, I, I do think that uh, we have... Um, uh, 
we have functional martyrs, so to speak, um, in plenty of other ancient cultures. I mean, if you, you can just think about, uh, you could easily make the argument that Socrates, for example, um, is a martyr, right? Even though he was never referred to as such um, because he willingly accepted a death sentence rather than stop philosophizing or a, a, a more um, a biblically relatable or intelligible parallel might be the story of, uh, of the mother, a Jewish woman in, in Second Maccabees, uh, one of the deuterocanonical books, um, who watches her seven sons, one after the next, uh, die horrible deaths. Uh, you know, they get their tongue cut out, their tongues cut out, uh, their heads scalped, their hands and feet cut off, you know, their bodies fried in a cauldron, it's awful. Um, all because they refused to violate the law as it was given to Moses and eat pork, right? Um, so they're not dying for Christ, but they seem to be dying for the law. And very intriguingly, um, those those Maccabees, those Maccabean boys were kind of claimed after the fact by Christians as, you know, Christian martyrs, even though, uh, you know, they're, they're dying not for Jesus and certainly even before Jesus uh, existed, right? But, but they saw, early Christians definitely saw a parallel there in this willful, uh, this willing acceptance of pain and torture and death um, rather than renounce the law of your God, or in the case of the Christians, renounce their God. Um, so, I think that Christian notions of martyrdom are um, are unique in many ways, um, but they they borrow from the cultural context of which from which they arose in late antiquity, and um, uh, are maybe different in uh, uh, maybe not different in uh, in kind, so to speak, from uh, many other religions. But you know. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about, you know, what role martyrs play in important early Christian texts? And then, you know, in texts throughout Christian history, you know, as much as you can talk about the last 2000 years. Uh, sure. Well, uh, maybe I'll just uh, I'll focus on a couple here. Um, I, I, I think um, I mean, well, certainly they play a very large role. Um, um, the martyrs do in, in early Christian texts, especially beginning around the fourth century and, and, and onward, uh, when we really begin to get uh, a, quite a number of these texts being written, some perhaps earlier in the third century, for sure, um, but mostly in the fourth century, when the cult of the saints takes off as well, right? So I think that's important to remember, is to pair uh, these literary sources um, with all of the ritual and cultural practices associated with the telling of those stories, because most Christians wouldn't have been encountering these stories by you know getting a volume down off the shelf and saying okay well let's read about this saint let's read about this saint and you know they're not just flipping through these stories one after the next like we might find them um, in certain collections today they're encountering them liturgically either they're hearing them uh, you know the stories being told uh, by a priest by a bishop who's preaching about that particular martyr usually on the day of, of, of their death or they're hearing the story if they visit some shrine you know so they're encountering them in ways that aren't just literary. Um, but what I think is, is particularly interesting, um, you know, you just, to, to answer this question about how important the martyrs are from even early on, is, as I mentioned before, um, all, all of the closest followers of Jesus, with the exception uh, of John, uh, have some story about them, about them dying very violently. Um, about them dying as martyrs. Um, my colleague, David Eastman, uh, I mean, there's there's so many deaths of just, uh, uh, so many versions of the deaths of Peter and Paul alone that my colleague, David Eastman, once published a book that was called The Many Deaths of Peter and Paul, where he sort of goes through all of these different stories, um, many of which have, you know, more or less the same sort of contours, but many of which are quite different. Um, from one another, but all telling different stories about the deaths of these two uh, very important uh, followers of Jesus, right? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these are contradictory in where or, or how or even when they say that this or that apostle was killed. Um, but we have a lot of consensus traditions, right, that Peter was crucified upside down in certain versions of the story because of his own humility, because he didn't want to be, he didn't want to directly mimic the death of his Lord, right? And so it's an act of humility for him to be crucified on an inverted cross. That 
isn't part of the tradition early on, but that you know develops as as part of the tradition. Um, that Paul was beheaded is the, the the consensus that both of them were killed, both Peter and Paul, sometime around uh, the early '60s, perhaps in Rome, uh, Nero's Rome, Emperor Nero's Rome. Um, that Bartholomew was flayed. Right, he had his you know, skin peeled off. If flayed isn't a, a word in your everyday vocabulary, I mean, we can um, link this with the iconography for that because you know, some of the icons and the uh, images show him holding his skin. Um, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, especially um, in the, um, uh, the the altar wall fresco in the uh, in the Sistine Chapel uh, uh, that painted by Michelangelo, um, you have this image, thanks to Michelangelo, of Bartholomew, the Apostle Bartholomew, hovering on a cloud right at Jesus's feet. And in one hand, he's got this flensing knife. And in the other, he's holding up the empty bag of his own skin. Uh, and the intriguing little side, you know, tidbit of that is that uh, art historians have long surmised that the that the skin bag Bartholomew's, you know, boneless and sagging face was a self portrait that Michelangelo quietly painted into the fresco, which is totally fascinating, right? Um, you know, but anyway, um, I mean, what I think is uh, is is really interesting about these stories, right? I mean, they go on and on. Simon, that you know, maybe was sawn in half. Thomas was speared in India. Um, is it, what I think is interesting about them is that they use uh, the stories of these deaths of the apostles not only as a means of saying something about the apostles themselves and how they were willing to follow Jesus. Uh, unto death in just as violently uh, a way, um, but they also justify certain ideals that were important to the Christians who were writing these stories, um, in many cases, um, centuries after the fact. And a lot of these stories strangely focus on questions of virginity and celibacy, which were very important to a lot of ascetically minded Christians from, say, the fourth and fifth century, you know, and onward. So for just to give one example, in, um, in one version of Peter's martyrdom, uh, we're told that Peter somehow had access to Emperor Nero's concubines and that he was trying to convert them all to lives of chastity, which uh, I think it goes without saying didn't exactly endear him to uh, the emperor if he's, uh, you know, turning all of his concubines chaste. Um, you know, and there's a similar tradition about Matthew and uh, where, you know, he's trying to uh, convert a, uh, the, the king of Ethiopia. Um, I mean, a lot of these are very fanciful. A lot of them are written, uh, you know, after the fact. Um, but they're, they're often doing, uh, as I said, you know, two things. One, emphasizing the extent to which Jesus's closest followers also embraced uh, deaths along the lines of Jesus's. And two, um, they can then all tell other, they can, you can use those deaths of the apostles to make moral claims, to tell other stories, to make other points that are important to whoever happens to be writing, you know, the, the flavor of the day story uh, about these, uh, about these Christians. Um, but you asked for a, a, a long history, and I'm not going to give one since that's that's most of the book. Um, but I can jump, you know, all the way to the 16th century, and uh, with John Fox's Book of Martyrs. You know, John Fox was this English guy. Uh, he was an English Protestant during a time where there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of tumult in, in English Christianity as it becomes Protestant under Henry VIII, and then swings back to Catholicism under his daughter. Queen Mary, Bloody Mary, as she's known, Mary the First, and then swings back to Protestantism again uh, with uh, uh, the rule of Elizabeth. Um, so these, uh, you know, John Fox has this book uh, that, that he bills as a church history, um, the Acts and Monuments, it's called. And it's this massive, uh, ended up as a couple of volumes, and it was published in its uh, in the second version in which it was published. It's this massive history of the church, but it puts martyrs at the center. In fact, the, the, when it was published as two volumes, the whole second volume begins uh, specifically by talking about the martyrs. And what he's wanting to do is, 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 is chart this genealogy, to draw this narrative line uh, between the the martyrs, the Protestant martyrs who are being burned at the stake by Bloody Mary, Catholic queen of England at the time in the middle of the 16th century, um, uh, how they are connected to all of these martyrs stretching all the way back to the apostles, right? And just like I was saying earlier, and like you were saying too, like, well, we have all these stories, we have these stories, it seems like it should, it was thousands of people being killed, 
that's the impression when you read John Fox's book too, right? That you think that, oh my gosh, you know, Bloody Mary, she certainly earned her name. She must have killed thousands and thousands of Protestants. Well, actually what happened is, is that she killed maybe 300 people over the course of about a three year period. Um, I mean, that's not an insignificant number, but it's not a genocide, right? Um, and yet it's the stories and the fact that John Fox's book ended up in virtually every English church uh, from the 16th century onward because Queen Elizabeth saw it as a, as a, as a good propaganda campaign, not only for, um, for, for her uh, reign, um, but also by way of uh, for further Protestantizing uh, her realm, right? And so the stories get told again and again, and it takes on uh, a vastly greater importance than, uh, than the, the actual circumstances at the time might have suggested it would. Yeah, and, and thanks for using that example in particular, because I, I think some people watching, listening, they're like, okay, well, you know, uh, when the Protestant Reformation comes along, they, they kick out the martyrs, right? That, that's no longer an important aspect of Christianity. So, yeah, yeah. yeah but very much not true, right? Uh, the Protestantism uh, doesn't, doesn't get rid of the, uh, the cult of the dead. Well, uh, well, hang on. Uh, I would I would say that the in terms of the cult part, right? In terms of the 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 feast days on the calendar, in terms of the veneration of relics, um, in terms of you know the the pilgrimages and all these sort of other uh, physical, very very obviously Catholic or Orthodox sorts of uh, ritual practices, that those are certainly you know, not, you know, Martin Luther's not enthralled by those things. Right. Yeah. Um, but he does, he does uh, agree that, uh, that the story of somebody who uh, uh, testified through their body to their faith by willingly accepting death, that that's important. He agrees that the story can be edifying. Right. So the stories persist and Fox is certainly wanting to, to tie, as I said, to tie the stories of those who were killed by Queen Mary to the, this long chain, to create this long sort of chain of Christian suffering, to tie it back to the past. Uh, that, and, and the Protestants are still very much interested in early Christian history and in the early Christian martyrs, especially the apostles. Um, but it's the cult part that, uh, that they're not so interested in. Yeah. Right, right. So, so you yeah. mentioned relics. Can you explain what relics are and, and why they have magic powers? Sure. Um, I mean, so the, the, the term as it's, uh, you know, derived from Latin just means like the, the remnant of something or the, you know, the remains of, you know, what's left behind. Um, so, you know, somebody dies and what's left behind of them? Well, you've, you maybe have their clothes or their shoes or something that they touched, right? So some sort of remnant that's associated with them. Um, but often in, in Christian contexts, what we, what we mean when we say relics is we're specifically referring to bodily remains, right? Their bones. Uh, maybe their fingernails, maybe their hair, but usually their bones, right? The martyrs' bones. Um, and th there's a lot of emphasis uh, on the power of these bones in many Christian uh, texts and uh, and traditions, for sure. Um, uh, especially beginning in the fourth century, with the legalization of Christianity and with the promotion of Christianity, the imperial promotion of Christianity by the Emperor Constantine, who converted to Christianity, and, and his mother as well, uh, Helena, who goes on this, uh, you know, uh, archaeological expedition to the Holy Land and supposedly found the very cross upon which Jesus was crucified. Right, which which is interesting in that. Um, um, obviously for Jesus, uh, since Christian tradition uh, insists that he was bodily assumed into heaven after his, his death and resurrection, you don't have the bones. Uh, but what you do have are all of these objects that touched him during the time of his death, namely, most importantly, the cross, uh, but also the crown of thorns, the holy nails, the lance that the Roman soldier jabbed into him, and then certainly the relic that everybody's familiar with, the, the, the shroud. Uh, the Shroud of Turin. Um, everybody's heard of that, but it's actually quite late. I don't think that there's actually a reference to it until like the 14th century is the first time we have a reference to it. Um, but there are plenty of other uh, divinely infused textiles, uh, so to speak, uh, that were around before the Shroud of Turin that are, that are quite uh, important. Um, I talk about some of those in, in my book. I won't get into that right now. Um, but Back to the fourth century, um, you know, we have uh, this wonderful uh, letter 
that St. Ambrose of Milan wrote to his sister, Ambrose being uh, the, the, the tutor and sort of um, uh, master of St. Augustine, um, and uh, you know, the one who you know, sort of led him on and, and educated him in, in his uh, embrace of Christianity and Augustine's embrace of Christianity. So Ambrose, uh, Bishop of Milan, He's writing to his sister, and we have the year 386, right? So he's writing to his sister, and he's saying, we've got this new basilica that's just been built in Milan, and everybody is wanting me to properly consecrate it by putting some relics under the altar, bringing in some bones of the saints, bones of the martyrs into the altar. And he says, you know, uh, that that I didn't have any, you know, they were, they were out at the corner store that week or something, I guess. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then he says that this, this divine ardor entered his heart, that he knew where to dig, um, like some sort of buried treasure and that, uh, that he has one of his priests come over and he digs up the bones of Saints Gervasius and Protasius, you know, these ancient Christian martyrs. Right. And when the priests uh, dig them, dig up the bones, a sick man who had been brought to the site, was instantly uh, cured. And then later, as they're processing these bones, um, you know, from the site of where they had been found, of, of the site of their burial, into the basilica where they would now be enshrined, uh, a blind man uh, regains his sight, right? So you, you uh, and when Ambrose stands up, uh, you know, after they, they have, you know, properly installed these relics to consecrate this, uh, this new basilica, when Ambrose stands up and starts preaching to his congregation, um, he, he reminds them, he points to the Bible. He reminds them about uh, the passage in the Acts of the Apostles, where we hear that even if Paul touched just a few handkerchiefs or aprons, and that if then those handkerchiefs or aprons were brought to the sick, that they would be instantly cured. And he says, now I'm telling you the same thing. Bring your handkerchiefs, bring your aprons, touch them upon the bones of the martyrs. And then, you know, then you have this, uh, this contact relic, you know, you've got the, uh, you, or you've got this sort of, you know, relic that's been, because it's been touched to a relic. Um, that, that has this sort of divine power. Um, and that, um, that, that, that what, what uh, Ambrose outlines in many ways becomes kind of a, a template for the, um, uh, the authentication of martyrs' relics, right? Usually they had to cure somebody so that you knew that it was legit. I mentioned Helena before, you know, digging up uh, the, the supposed cross upon which Jesus was crucified. Well, in the story that's told about it, she digs up three crosses, right? Because of the two thieves who were crucified alongside Jesus. So how do you know which is the right one? Well, she has this sick woman come and she touches the first cross, nothing happens. She touches the second one, nothing happens. She touches the third one, she's cured, right? There's the one, right? That's now been uh, divinely authenticated as the as the true cross uh, of, of Christ, right? So you have these bones, you have fragments of the Holy Cross, you've got the crown of thorns, um, which uh, so through a very convoluted uh, 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 set of circumstances supposedly made its way to Paris uh, during the time of, of St. Louis, of King Louis the, uh, the Ninth, um, and that the, what he believed to be the crown of thorns was still there in Notre Dame uh, when Notre Dame caught on fire a few years ago, and there, there was that horrible uh, blaze that you know, brought down uh, its iconic spire and everything else, but that uh, uh, both a, a tunic that supposedly had belonged to, to King Louis, as well as the crown of thorns rescued by the Parisian fire brigade, right? So, you know, a lot of these things haven't entirely disappeared. Um, you can go on eBay and you can still find uh, little fragments of bones that are supposedly authenticated as having belonged to this, that, or the other saint. Um, so it, it, there's a long tradition of the importance of the physical remains as conveying the power of the saint. And as, as many have put it, both in antiquity and scholars you know, today, that the understanding is that the saint is still there, that the saint is in heaven, but is still somehow present on earth in, in his or her physical remains. And that therefore that the power of heaven, it, it becomes an earthly conduit to the divine. Yeah, uh, an important question I, I forgot to put in our, our preparatory sheet, yeah. but intercessory prayer, you know, uh, praying to the dead, with the dead. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that uh, uh, is, is justified in, in many ways throughout um, a number of different centuries uh, and traditions. Um, but there's this idea that the saints 
namely the martyrs, um, because I think when we're talking early on, especially that the martyrs are the saints par excellence through their uh, through their death and through their suffering, um, that that they have, you know, uh, perhaps you could say it, um, they have uh, they have the ear of God, they have the ear of Jesus, that they that they're proximate to Jesus because of their their suffering, and so. Um, you know, you you have some ailment, or you know, you are you are barren, and you're hoping for a child or something like that. Um, you pray to the saint for you know this uh, uh, this to be given to you, right, or for you to be cured. Um, and those sorts of those sorts of prayers. I mean, that 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 also helps explain a lot of the pilgrimages to the shrines of the saints. Um, because even though it was understood that, you know, saints could certainly work their miracles uh, from anywhere, that you didn't have to be right next to the bones or something, there was still this idea that that they're going to be more powerful at the site where their bones are, right? So you travel, you know, as Chaucer talks about in, 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 a, in a fictional way, the Canterbury Tales is there, it's a, it's a storytelling contest uh, among these fictional travelers who are all traveling from London to Canterbury to visit the the amazing church uh, in Canterbury, which also had at, at its eastern end uh, this amazing shrine to Saint Thomas Becket, uh, who was killed uh, in his church, uh, um, and then you know immediately becomes this becomes this martyr. Um, and to go back to uh, relics. Uh, I mean, he, he, this is somebody who became a saint lit overnight, literally. Uh, the as he was killed in his church, the 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 stones were mopped of the blood, and a townsman supposedly got hold of a piece of cloth that was soaked with the bishop's blood. He brought it home. He rinsed it out as best he could, and he gave the washing water to his wife to drink, and it was immediately cured her of of her paralysis. Right. Um, so. Uh, you know, these, these things are just, I mean, that, that's many centuries after Helena, um, but uh, they continue to be important. Awesome. Well, I, I think it's uh, time to wrap up. Of course, we could always talk about more, but uh, you should get the book, everybody. So it is, uh, we've been flashing the, the address on the screen. We're going to put it in the uh, uh, the show notes, but uh, ucpress.edu, uh, and then a whole bunch of other things after that. But uh, Dr. Kyle Smith, thanks so much for coming on the show. Before we go, I'll, I'll do our quick uh, commercial for our Patreon, patreon.com slash Gnostic for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can help us uh, keep going, and you can fund us buying some uh, relics on ebay uh so uh make sure you make sure you, you check that out or paypal.me slash gnostic for one-time donations uh dr smith thanks again Bye. my pleasure